I think uh, what we are expecting, speaking from uh, the viewpoint from the DRC, the DR Congo, is uh, the exchange of uh, experience, learn from others, and um, the knowledge that uh, we can share between countries because uh, we are coming from different uh, contexts. Even though, as you said, the problems are uh, to be understood globally, but uh, on the ground, there are some peculiar uh, characteristics depending on, on the countries. So learning from others is uh, very helpful. Uh, can you say what are the major um, challenges that you're facing in terms of climate change and sustainability? Uh, f first, it's um, it's um, the we we are uh, Congo is a, a rich country in terms of resources, and uh, so far the consumption rate of those resources is very low. Uh, but at the same time, that means that uh, there are huge human needs that uh, have to be met. Now the problem is uh, how are we going to to meet these human uh, these human needs? Uh, we can uh, meet them um, as usual, uh, which means uh, following the path that developed countries have followed, with uh, then as a consequences of the negative effects uh, on the environment. Um, but on the other hand, uh, are there other paths? Uh, are, the, are there other ways of uh, of achieving uh, achieving those uh, those needs? Uh, that's the most important thing uh, that uh, we are facing, actually. And um, particularly in a country which is urbanizing very, very fast, coming from um, a situation where energy uh, is basically wood-based uh, biogas, uh, biomass energy, how do you uh, complete the shift from uh, wood-based uh, biomass energy to let's say, less polluting uh, energy to satisfy the needs in, in, in the urban areas. So we have uh, uh, read it at very many places and also in, uh, in the COP11 Biodiversity Summit in Hyderabad, India. Um, we, we learned that con conflicts in Congo uh, are becoming more and more endemic and, and leading to uh, very difficult situations in terms of uh, implementing climate change policies and biodiversity uh, protection uh, along with taking care of economic growth. Yeah. How is um, the, dem the, the Democratic Republic of Congo dealing with this entire situation? Yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's a major, a major issue uh, for Congo. First of all, when, when you have a conflict of the extent and of the length that uh, we've had, uh, you will have internally displaced people. Right. Uh, and these are huge numbers of people, actually, who have to flee the, uh, the living areas. Mm -hmm. uh, this will dis disrupt agriculture, mm -hmm. and this will uh, disrupt uh, not only agriculture, but uh, then you have uh, hundreds of thousands of people living in, in IDP camps, mm -hmm. putting a lot of pressure mm -hmm. on uh, forests. Mm -hmm resources where they are located because they will be living on a very, very low resource base in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of money or in terms of earning mm -hmm. uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at the same time, these conflicts are actually are taking place in the very area in the country where we have um, large areas of protected areas. Uh, with uh, unique species like the okapi or some other of these uh, uh, species that you only find in the country. So when you have uh, that, um, uh, that level of uh, conflict uh, with uh, arms circulating at a high extent, then uh, of course we have experienced so very often that these species are endangered and that the protected areas are no longer protected uh, because the public institutions in charge of protecting those areas then are actually uh, not feeling safe. Uh, the, the officials are, can, are not feeling safe and cannot work as, uh, as, uh, as needed. Um, 
so um Congo has a very rich biodiversity and yeah. very rich, very very large expanse of forests. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's looked upon, uh, and Red Plus is looked upon as a very very good opportunity uh, to uh, ensure that market space mechanisms lead to uh, green growth yeah. in the in the region. Yeah. Uh, what are the prospects as far as Congo is concerned? We've just completed our our preparation phase of the Red Plus uh, scheme. We, we presented in Doha in November the, the strategy framework, the national strategy framework mm -hmm. for Red Plus. We've uh, set up a, a national Red Plus fund, right. uh, which is uh, still in its infancy, we should say. Mm -hmm. So we are now in the process of, uh, uh, of uh, raising funds so that we can start our investment phase. Uh, to make sure that, as you said, uh, market-based instruments will, uh, uh, will lead uh, our efforts in terms of uh, forest uh, conservation. Yeah. So the hydroelectricity potential in the Congo is supposed to be immense, immense. And it's yeah. said that if it's harnessed properly, it can, it can light up all of Africa. Yeah. How do you think this, this can be harnessed? Yeah, that's true. You're right. Uh, hydropower potentially is estimated at uh, 100,000 megawatts. Megawa it's very huge, and uh, we have one of probably uh, the richest site in, in the world, and the Inga site, which uh, in itself has a potential of 40,000 megawatts of hydropower. But um, being a low-income country, Engaging in these uh, hydro power projects, which are uh, costly, so uh, the main problem we have is a problem of uh, of funding. Of course, we know that uh, funding can be privately, you know, uh, secured. Um, uh, now we are starting uh, the Inga Tree uh, project, uh, which uh, because we have Inga One and Inga Two, but these are only 2.5% two, 2 of, of the potential. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we are now preparing uh, a third large dam, uh, which will be about 4,000 4, uh, megawatts of, uh, of power. Um, the main obstacle we have is funding. And of course, uh, we think that uh, technology as well, uh, making sure that it's not only uh, foreign-based technology, but uh, we have to uh, to secure some uh, home-based te technology in terms of uh, hydropower uh, production. Um, uh, um, one final question to you. A lot of deliberation is taking place as far as climate change and sustainability is concerned. And although we are seeing action, do you think that we are seeing enough action given the situation we are in today? Unfortunately, no. There is too much talk and uh, very little action. I think the facts are known. Uh, the, the risks are well estimated, well assessed. And I think what, uh, what the world needs now is really some bold action so that we can move from where we are now to a, a different, uh, a different uh, situation. If we don't do, uh, let's say, as we use, we use now to say in the Congo, what we will do or what we will not do of our forests in the Congo will have some influence on, on the whole planet. So I think uh, we are getting, getting a little bit uh, discouraged by this lengthy talk on climate right. change. Yeah. So we've seen how ineffective some of these uh, international uh, multilateral uh, platforms have been and how it becomes difficult to negotiate for some of the countries. Uh, do you think uh, climate change cooperation in the lines of bilateral cooperation and relationship with countries on one-on-one -on -one basis uh, can fetch more benefits than uh, cooperating at, um, on a multilateral scale? I think on the, 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 on the multilateral scale, wh what is important is the, uh, the public awareness uh, raising the awareness on, on, on the situation. And either bilateral or multilateral, the most important thing is this shared responsibility. Right. So 
we know who are responsible of uh, the mess in which we are now. And uh, so if, if responsibilities are well established, so why are we, are, why are we continuing to, to talk? Why don't we just get on and say, uh, as uh, the polluters, pre principles say, so those who polluted, those who contributed, we are not saying that we are not contributing, but we are contrib or we have contributed less. So those who contributed more, they have to pay a larger share of what is needed to solve this situation. Thanks.